preparing to start the day's work. He hears something over the horizon. What starts as a cloud of dirt and silhouettes grows into an entourage of more than a thousand emus. They're heading towards the coast for breeding season, and no man, woman, or beast will get in their way. Within minutes, the farm is overtaken by the flightless birds. They begin consuming and spoiling the crops, tearing down fences, laying claim to the land. The stock market crashes. Millions of investors are wiped off the face of Wall Street. Jobs are lost. Industrial output all but ceases. Side by side with countries throughout the world, Australia is knee deep in the Great Depression. In the Campion District, in the western side of the country, discharged veterans of World War I are given a gleam of hope. The government offers them financial aid. All they have to do? Increase their weed crops. The hustle begins. Darkness, then light. Oxygen fills its lungs for the first time. Large eyes stare back at him. He is the firstborn. Another emerges from the protection of the egg this one striped, yet another, and another. His brothers and sisters look nothing like him, yet all of them feel familiar. He barely knows how to walk. His father shows the way forward. You are watching this road. Farmers in the area are reporting similar emu incidents. A few of the youngest men are sent to Tenterden, where the Minister of Defense, Sir George Pierce, also has a farm. They relay their concerns, and a plan is constructed. The farmers would provide ammunition payments, food, and accommodation in exchange for military personnel sent by the Australian government. Each would be equipped with military grade machine guns ready to eradicate the targets. The first strike is primed to begin the last week of October under the command of Major GPW Meredith of the 7th Heavy Battery. Two additional commanding soldiers arrive at the remote town. They set up two Lewis guns and 10,000 rounds of ammunition. They wait. Rain strikes. Emus scatter to a wider area, and the troops wait for the weather to clear. Robert Weber is returning home from a vacation with his dog at the Kilkevin Hotel in Queensland, Australia. He's heard of a shortcut to reach his hometown of Narangba. After a few minutes of driving on the main road, he takes a right-hand turn past the signpost. He's been driving for about three hours now with no sign of life. It begins raining heavily, then his car gets stuck, tries pushing, then revving, then pushing, eventually it breaks down. He has about three days of water. In the hopes someone may drive by, he remains in his car. 
will be breezier. After a chilly start, it will be mostly dry on Thursday. Him and his dog abandon the car and follow the road. Then the road ends. Hoping civilization is near, he ventures on further into the bush. A group of locals are sent to loop around the backside of the emus with the goal of hurting them in range of the ballistics. The targets break off into smaller groups and run. Nevertheless, a few are taken down. Major Meredith establishes an ambush near the local dam. 24 hours earlier, 1,000 emus were spotted heading towards this position. Gunners are strategically positioned for close proximity. Within moments, the emus are sweeping across the area. The finger is on the trigger. 12 shots ring out. Then, the gun jams. Major Meredith makes the decision to move further south. He's been given intel from scouts that each pack of emus seem to have their own leader now. One of these leaders is dubbed Big Black, standing at nearly six feet high. He keeps watch while the others graze, lets out a warning cry when he spots the soldiers. Orders are given to attach a machine gun on top of a truck, an attempt to speed up the otherwise wasted time spent waiting for the emu's navigation patterns. Their efforts are unsuccessful. The terrain is too bumpy to get a clear shot, and even at the speed of a six-cylinder four-wheeler, the emus outpace. By November 8th, six days after the first engagement, 2,500 rounds have been fired across every station set up by the Major. Total birds killed. Negative press begins circulating. He withdraws from the territory. James Mitchell, the Premier of Western Australia, raises concerns about the emu presence. He states they are a serious agricultural threat in providing food for the rest of the country. He proposes more military intervention. His plea is approved. More soldiers and more guns arrive at the small town. They set up position where the emus have been known to gather. Over the first two days, Day three. This trend continues into the latter half of November. The soldiers grow more familiar with the movement patterns of the emus, and by December 2nd, averaging 10 rounds per confirmed kill. Eventually, the season of bloodshed ends. The emus return back to the inlands, and what remains is the survival of man and the survival of bird. Robert traverses an embankment of boulders. Then, his foot slips. He survives the fall with just a few scratches, but all of his supplies are scattered. What he has left is a knife. The terrain grows deeper. And in the search for water, his only companion his dog becomes separated. Robert finds a dam with mushrooms. He sets up camp. As he sleeps, ants attack his body. He moves his spot. Again, ants attack his body. Miles away, farmers are hurting their animals. When a pair of them come across an abandoned car on a dirt road. The police are notified, and the state emergency services begin their search. Helicopters and ground crews survey hundreds of miles, encapsulating their area of interest. Robert hears something. He gets up and attempts to wave down the rescue vehicle. But he's just on the boundary of their search. 
color of his clothes blend into the terrain, and just like that, the little hope he had slips. Andy is commuting to work on the morning train. It's busy today as it is any other day. As he walks into the cab, he's knocked off center by the crowd inside. He takes a step back to balance himself and immediately, his leg slips in between the platform and the train. There's 30 seconds left before the train departs and now, passengers immediately take notice and call for the train operator not to move the cab. He tries lifting up his leg, but his kneecap can't get through the yellow plastic barrier. A lady suggests. Another says. The Transperth transportation cards guide passengers to try and push the train to widen the gap. Altogether, some 30 commuters push in unison on the side of cab 592. Andy's uninjured leg is freed. Ongoers clap, take pictures for social, then board the train and continue their day. Robert is in a pit of depression. Hours pass, more mushrooms, more water, more mushrooms, more water. Then he snaps himself out of it. No depression. Keep the hope, he thinks. The thought of his two sons keep him going. After nearly two weeks of non-stop searching, the Queensland police call off their efforts. It's early morning in the bush. Again, Robert hears something. Not a helicopter this time. Tony Perrette, owner of the land that housed the rescue efforts, continues his search, hoping to strike gold. And just like that, Tony spots Robert. In a way, it was serene because I could hardly believe it. It was uh, one of the greatest moments in my life. Positive thinking won't let you do anything, but it will let you do everything. Cold shower a day keeps the doctor away. I think certainly uh, being focused on something that you're confident will have high value to someone else and then just work like hell.
man, our, our clever human lives in a maze. <laughs>